Hello, this is Catherine, as I know I need to stop talking. Hello, loves, how are we doing? It's bank holiday weekend when nobody knows what day it is, or more to the point, nobody will have a fucking clue for the next two weeks what day the bin goes out. Fuck, I mean, I just... I'm sure there is like some special adult in class that must come up at some point when I learn to do things like a proper grown up, i.e. find out what day the bins go out. But at this point, I haven't got a fucking clue. I'm not going to lie. I mean, thank you all so much for your lovely, lovely, lovely responses on, on the post that I shared on Facebook about the fact we've done this for one year. One year. Yay. One year of podcasting. Hooray. And I just can't believe that people listen to this shit. And once again, this is the reason that I must never, ever, ever go into PR. I'd be fucking awful. But I can't. But I love, love, love that you do. And a particular shout out, hopefully you're listening this week, to Judy and your lovely family. Because I literally love, with all of my entire soul and being, the fact that you guys gather around your Sunday lunch and and listen to this shit. Literally listen to me rambling on about shit while you eat your Sunday lunch. Uh, it just blows, blows my mind. You're all brilliant. Brilliant. I love you all. I love you all loads. I love you when they're in, in the UK or people listening in, in New Zealand or I even saw that we like hit the charts in France. Like, I, I bonjour. That That is probably the extent of my of my French language skills. Although I'm not quite as bad as Mr. I Know I Need to Stop Talking, who memorably once managed to ask for oral sex during his French GCSE oral exam on the basis that that was the only French that he'd bothered learning. Bravo, bravo. But yeah, wherever you are, it's 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 bonkers and I love it and I love you all and thanks so much for, for letting me ramble on about, about shit, basically. It's been quite a week. It's been quite a week. I mean, a lot of football stuff going on. So a brief recap for those who perhaps haven't seen on Facebook. So Beth won an award this week and, I, and I'm really conscious that I possibly sound like a little bit of a dick when I talk about Beth's football because I am that mum and I know that I'm that mum and that mum going look at my darling isn't she brilliant but I, I hope I, I don't intend it to come across in any way other than I am just so proud of her and I'm so proud of her because I think she pushes on with a football despite the fact that you know when you're 10 nearly 11 being the only girl in a team of otherwise only boys is that's, that's I, well I couldn't have done it at that age but but she does it and she plows on and she's had some some twists and turns and a few knocks this season and you know let's be honest Covid's been unbelievably tough for anybody in grassroots sport I think and we definitely had a blip when they started back and she didn't want to go but she's kept going and she's kept going and so for her to turn up they had an awards ceremony on Monday afternoon and for her to turn up at the awards ceremony and then completely against her and my wildest expectations to be one of the small number of people who were actually awarded in the ceremony for the, for the hard work and the effort she put in that season. Like, literally, it's one of those things where you're like, look at my child, it's my child, she's done something amazing. But just to see the look on her face and I just, oh, grassroots sports volunteers, you are just amazing. But we were coming back in the car and Beth went, how much do they get paid? I'm like, what? She's a bit obsessed with money. She went, how much do they get paid? I said, who? And she named her coaches. I said, they don't get anything, sweetheart. She said, why do they do it then? I said, because they love it. And you could like literally see the realisation on her face like, oh. But honestly, no no words for the for the efforts that go in from, from Beth's coaches and, and hundreds and thousands of others like them all around the country. So, so that was Monday night. So that was, yeah, that was kind of like a completely unexpected and yeah, really, really amazing. Then we had more football because this is my life. We had more football on Tuesday when her girls team were playing a boys team and it was it was pretty tight and the boys came ahead but only slightly and Beth managed to score the only goal and swear to God, just to provide balance in my proud mum's statements, it was the most fucking ridiculous goal of all time. She literally like kneed it over the keeper and then I think scored it with her belly button. I said to her afterwards, did you mean to do that? She was like, no. So, yeah, that was the most ridiculous goal of all time. And then on Thursday, and a bit of a theme for me at the moment is just those moments that I one million percent would have taken for granted pre-pandemic. And now I try to take nothing for granted. I try to, like, squeeze every single ounce of joy out of every single moment, just live it to the absolute max, because I definitely feel now that all that stuff that I 100% took for granted... I don't know that I'll always be able to do that. I don't know that that will always be there. And I, I kind of need to remember to keep this perspective because I think what I've done, and I'm a self-confessed optimist as long-time listeners will know, but I, what it's definitely done for me is it's really made me, I hope, I believe, just appreciate the, the absolute mundane and the everyday. And pre-COVID, Beth's training sessions, I would have like dropped her there. I wouldn't have given it a thought. I'd been like, right, you're off to training and, and we'll see you later. But... 
or I can, I've tried to make the time to actually go and, and pop down and watch, even if it's like the last 10 minutes or so. So I did that on Thursday evening. She was training with the boys and they'd split the team in half. And they're playing a training match. And genuinely score lines too they really don't matter they really don't matter you know I, I want her to do well I want the team to do well but most of all I want them all to have a load of fun but this was just one of those golden evenings the sun was shining down sky was blue they had three of the coaches working with them the coaches were playing on the teams as well the kids were laughing the coaches were laughing Beth who has definitely felt isolated from that team at the time she was absolutely in the midst of it they were playing together just so amazingly as a team. They were passing up and down the pitch. It was just one of those moments you want to pinch yourself. So ordinary and yet so completely extraordinary at the same time. And they just went up and down the pitch and just just brilliant play and laughing all the time. And, and Beth's team ended up winning, like I said, the scoreline hardly mattered. It was a 3-2 result. But there is also a little bit of me that is unashamedly proud of the fact that the only girl on the, on the pitch scored, scored the hat trick. And that was another amazing moment. But just those golden moments, golden moments that I think I would have missed pre-pandemic. And honestly, it's, yeah, I'm trying very hard to ensure that I never, ever, ever take moments like that for granted. Ever, ever, ever again. And meanwhile, while all of this football success was going on, of course, Jamie was having his own personal successes. I think making for the world record in longest period of time spent lying in your bed, eating pizza, watching television, living your absolute best life. And I went in and said to him, do you want to do something? And he looked at me like, why in the world would I want to do anything when I have everything I could possibly need right there? And I thought, good on you, mate. You live your best life because come next week, <laughs> back at school, I mean, anybody else genuinely worried about the sort of Monday, Tuesday, whenever you go back, alarm call. I don't know how I'm going to get my children up. As, as an example, this morning we were we were staying away, which I'll tell you about shortly, and I went in about nine o'clock and woke Jamie up because I was like, we're going to have breakfast in 20 minutes. He's like, okay, cool, I'm just coming. 20 minutes passed, breakfast is being served up. I said to Beth, I said, run up and see where your brother is. She ran up, yeah, he'd literally gone, yeah, I'm just coming, and had laid back down on the bed and gone straight back to sleep. I mean, fuck, this is, this is the foreseeable future, isn't it? I'm not even going to get teeth, hair, shoes. I'm going to be like, get up, get up, get up, get out of fucking bed, get up, get up, get up. Oh, my God. Yeah, I mean, like maybe Department for Education, if you're listening to this, because I'm sure it's where you take all of your inspiration from. If you wanted to consider, like, I don't know, a slightly later school start for the first week, just to give us parents a fighting fucking chance, I, I would be fully, fully on board with, fully on board with this. But yeah, proof, proof definitely this week that success comes in all different shapes and sizes, and proof that definitely those those little golden moments are some of the some of the most important of all. I'm just back with the kids actually I'm recording this on Saturday evening and Ocado have been for those who are worried about my continual Ocado relationship they will bang on bang on tonight five o'clock here drop the shopping off one substitution done sorted took the bags shopping put away we've got it down to fine art I think if there are ever Ocado speed trials which I like literally live in hope will be the next sport put into the Olympics I reckon me and Jamie can smash it we are the dream team in our household. Mr. I know I need to stop talking to Beth. They, you know, they, they step up to the plate and they help, but Beth gets very easily distracted and, and Mr. I know I need to stop talking like structure and order, which Jamie and I just don't have even slightly. So when it comes to bigger cardo shops, like at Christmas, me and Jamie lock them out of the kitchen. We're like, it's fine, a cardo dream team. We're here. We put on our tunes. We probably drop some shopping, break a few bits, almost certainly lose a few bits and put them into places that we can't find them later. But we have a lovely time. We have a lovely time. It's definitely not the most efficient, but it is the most enjoyable. Anyway, I can't have been. But we are back. Myself, Jamie and Beth went on a brief road trip the last sort of 24, 48 hours. And we popped up to see my parents who live separately out probably, well, I was going to say about two hours from us, but bring the M25 into the mix and anything fucking goes. I mean... I just think the M25, there must be a better way. There must be a better way. I don't know what it is. Teleportation springs to mind. We drove up on Friday and I, and I appreciate that the world and their dog are trying to move around on a bank holiday weekend. But naively, I kidded myself that it would be fine. Listeners, it was not fine. It's just like fucking the traffic just stands still and you're like, what are you doing? Where are you going? And you think, well, okay, well, there must be something dramatic up ahead. There must be like a herd of escaped wildebeest or there must be like... I don't know, 12 jumbo jets landed on the M25 from Heathrow. No, no, when you get there, there's just like 
one car going slightly slower than perhaps it should have done. You're just like, what the fuck? I don't understand. However, it is obviously like a gazillion times easier now that the children are much older. And I mean, to be honest, I, I barely knew I had them in the car at all. So they both refuse to sit in the front seat. I don't know. Is this just me? Does anybody else's kids? Like when I was a child, me and my sister used to fight to the death for the front seat. I'd win, obviously, because I was bigger and more of an ass. Sorry, Helen. But it, it was like a big thing to sit in the front. These days, I said to them both, I was like, oh, dad's not coming. So one of you can sit in the front. Both looked at me. Joe was like, no, you're all right. I'll sit here. Beth's like, I quite like sitting in the back. Okay, fine, whatever. But you know, the plus side is, hardly realised they were there. Jamie gets in, plugs himself into his headphones. That's it, he's gone. And Beth just goes off into, into kind of a Beth world or furiously falls asleep. She has a an unnerving knack of falling asleep at exactly the point she wants to fall asleep because she's so furious she's been forced on a car journey, which has kind of worked out really well over over the years. And um, and yeah, and then when, when they did kind of emerge from their headphones and their sleeping, we played aggressively competitive car games, which is really intense. Beth came up with a new car game. So anybody looking for a car game for the bank holiday weekend, this is Beth's car game. Suspect it's not completely original, but we'll call it the Beth's car game for the time being. And you have to think of a common category. So it might be your name or it might be the football team you support, for example. And then you have to find the letters of that name or football team or whatever in order on the number plates as you go past so I support Liverpool much to Beth's disgust but I support Liverpool so I would have to find an L but if I saw a P I couldn't store that P up for later no you've got to find your I and your V first it was very very competitive and went to a knife edge leading to me actually slightly tragically because I'd clearly got into the aggressively competitive side of things punching the air as we drove into my dad's road and I found an O and an L in quick succession I was like fucking yes mummy is the winner obviously you know you're supposed to encourage it's about the taking part children not the winning it was totally about the fucking winning mummy's the winner yes so yeah it was um yeah it was a, it was a joy of a car journey despite the hell of the M25 and and in sharp contrast like I say with with when they were younger or probably my most memorable hellish car journey of all time was coming down the self self same stretch of, of road coming back from my mum's and it was probably about maybe three years ago and the kids have always been really really good travellers like when I was a kid I was car sick a lot and as was my sister so god knows how my parents coped with that but my kids have always been really 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 good in the car so unfortunately it makes you get a little bit blasé and a little bit complacent like oh they're fine we've never had any problems well, on this journey we did, because what happened was we'd been to see, stay with my mum and had briefly met my dad as well and had gone to pick some blackberries in the fields over the back of the houses. And I think this is where all the problems started because Jamie had loaded up on about 12 tonnes of blackberries and had then got into the car and had decided to stare down at some match tax cards as I drove down the very, very, very windy roads coming out of the, the little tiny village where my mum lives and where I grew up. And we got to the end of one of the little tiny windy roads. Nowhere to stop as well, goes without saying. Mum, mum, I'm going to be sick, I'm going to be sick. And so fortu fortuitously, my mum did what I think all mums the world over probably do for their children, which is they don't ever entirely trust you, even as an adult, to be capable of feeding yourself. So I had left my mum's house with, I'm not exaggerating, two full carrier bags, including things like, homemade Chinese food and a freshly baked gluten-free banana loaf and I mean you name it like fresh fruit fresh vegetables so in some kind of dramatic like a like a contemporary dance move I kind of like flung my left arm out into the passenger seat where the one of the bags of food was sitting hurled the food inside the inside of the car I was not concerned about that at the moment because I, I was far more concerned about what the inside of my car was going to look like very very shortly if I didn't sort the shit out and flung the carry bag in Jamie's direction just in time just in time so noises that I won't share because Judy and your family you're having your Sunday lunch I don't want to ruin it but noises consummate with vomiting were heard from the back seat and I said well done brilliant you mean taking the bag fantastic and we'll pull over in a minute and we'll just get you some water and everything and so then I found somewhere to pull over and sort them out and everything and kind of that, I thought was that. I was like, okay, done, crisis averted, we're done, we're sorted. I said, come and sit in the front with me. Anyway, so we then moved from where we were then and we went on to the M25 and he was kind of like sitting in the front of me. He had been fine and then suddenly he was like, oh no, no, my stomach really hurts, mum. Oh, it really hurts. No, I'm going to be sick. I'm going to be sick. I had prepared for this eventuality, listeners. I had provided a second carry bag. And then he's like, I need to get out. So what do you mean you need to get out? We're in gridlock on the M25. I need to get out. 
I said, well, you can't. We're on the M25 in gridlock. Oh, it hurts. Oh, I'm going to be sick. So I'm like, well, mate, just crack on. You're not getting out on the M25. Meanwhile, in the background, Beth completely lost her shit. Beth doesn't like it when people are sick. And don't get me wrong, I'm sure it's none of our ideas of a great day out. But Beth really doesn't like it. So in my rear view, I've got Jamie writhing like some kind of salmon next to me in the passenger seat. In the rear view mirror, I can see Beth kind of like hunched over into, you know, the brace position that they tell you to go into when you fly in an aeroplane? Yeah, Beth was basically in the brace position with her hands over her head and, and kind of like her elbows over her ears going, la la la, I don't like it, I don't like it. And I'm going, fuck my fucking life, when will this end? So eventually the, the gridlock cleared and there's there's then somewhere that I know when I get off the, the M25 at the junction we go down, there's somewhere that I know you can you can kind of stop, which has public toilets and a car park and things. So I drove there, like, you know, so grateful. And Jamie jumped up the car and sprinted towards the toilets and I sort of followed him at a safe distance going, what have I done to deserve this? Meanwhile, Beth's walking next to me, sort of dragging her feet, holding my hands and suddenly from nowhere she suddenly goes oh god I'm gonna be sick as well and she bolted into the other toilets and I'm literally standing there going I just I I, I don't know there was nothing in the parenting books that that prepared me for this so shouting into the gents and like you know sort of shouting in for Jamie like I'm just going into the toilets next door you do what you gotta do and stuff I then run in after Beth who's run into one of the cubicles and ma is making the most gratuitous retching noises you have ever heard some other woman's coming out. I'm like, I'm so sorry. She's like, oh, one of those days, is it? I was like, fucking tell me about it. And um, so so she's got into the obscure. She's <clears throat> she's making these retching noises. And and then she comes out and I was like, were well, you sick? She's like, no. Like, look at me. Like, why would you say that? And I was like, well, it fucking sounds like you were. And I was like, oh, okay. She's like, no, I'm fine. Fine. Okay. Of course you were. Feel like, feeling at this point like I'm definitely in a hidden camera show. And so she washes her hands and we go out of the toilets. And Jamie's sitting there all dead relaxed and happy. I said, you're right, were you sick again? Oh no, he said, I worked out what it was. I said, what was it? He said, I just needed a really big poo. Good, excellent, marvellous. So eventually, got them both back in the car, surrounded by carry bags, which I'd, I'd filched off a, off a lovely guy with a, a roadside stall. I said, I'm so sorry to ask, I've got no cash, but please don't make me do this car journey without some carry bags, which he'd donated. And then we got onto the road home and there was a road closure. And at that point, I just thought, why me, life, why me? But we got home in one piece and it suffice to say, a lot of wine was drunk that evening. So yeah, by, by contrast, this was positively breezy as a journey, positively positively breezy and yeah just just went up to just gonna spend a night with my dad and then pop in and see my mum and they are such small things to do but like I said I will never ever ever take for granted again I will never take for granted the hugs again it was quite poignant it was the first time that I've been to my dad's house since the pandemic well since before the pandemic it was December 2019 when I last went up and the last time I'd hugged him before the pandemic was on the road outside of his house and back then you just took it for granted you were going to be able to hug the people you loved again, didn't you? I certainly did. And so we'd said goodbye, but right through sort of the period of time of, you know, however long it was of not being able to give him a hug. And I just kept thinking back to that time, just thinking, oh, I wish I'd known. I wish, I wish I'd put I wish I'd put more effort into it. I'd have, I'd have really gone for like the gold standard of hugs. And in case, you know, instead of possibly my arm was in the wrong place or was holding my handbag and things. But yeah, to, to go back up and just to be able to, to just hug the people you love. Oh, it's... um. Yeah, it's it's just such a treat, and ju and just you know the the little conversation. I mean, I, I chat to my dad. Or I've always chat to my dad about absolutely anything and everything. In fact, we were saying at some point I'll I'll bring him on here as a guest onto the podcast, and then we were kind of like, oh, we should share some some of our anecdotes. And then he was like, well, which ones? Because we probably got about a hundred hours worth, and we probably we probably probably have. But for anybody who wonders, well, you say you share everything with your dad. How how much do you actually share? Well. One of my favourite moments, which I think perfectly depicts our relationship, one that we both laugh about a lot, was years and years ago, I was at drama school and I was up in Birmingham and I'd been the day before to have my first ever smear test. I'd never had a smear test before. Smear tests, very good, very important. Please, if you get an offer for a smear test, go and have one. If it feels scary, loads of really good, helpful stuff online. Talk to the medical practitioners and they will help you, but please, 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 really important. Here endeth the lesson. Anyway, I'd gone for my, my first ever smear test and, and being a drama student, I was, you know, certainly not bothered by the idea of, of spreading my legs akimbo in front of some random woman. So I'd, I'd dutifully gone gone in and I'd, I'd done just that. 
and the nurse had done what uh, she had to do up there and then and then she she'd said to me she had said good as me she said you've got a really accessible cervix and I was so proud because she'd said it in such a lovely way like this brilliant you've got a really accessible cervix I thought brilliant I had no idea really that I even had a cervix or what its purpose was but I've got one and it's accessible it's like it's the kind of thing that you want on like your your house particulars aren't you on right move uh spacious back garden uh plenty of parking and really accessible cervix fantastic so the next morning I was on on the bus on the packed number 82 bus going going into drama school and I was sitting with a few of my friends and as as usual on on sort of morning commuter transport nobody's really talking very much apart from me and my friends and and so we're chatting and stuff and anyway halfway through the conversation my phone rang and it was my dad just to say hi and stuff and I said daddy daddy guess what and he said what and in a drama student-esque voice on the top deck of the packed number 82 bus I said I had my first smear test yesterday and the nurse said I've got a really accessible cervix and credit to my dad he didn't pause for even a nanosecond he went that's fantastic I'm really proud of you so yeah if, if you know if you if you want the defining example of, of me I really do share everything with my dad that that's a perfect example and and hooray for having a really accessible cervix it's 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 done very little for me during life you know generally in terms of having an accessible cervix it's it's not like having I don't know skills in gymnastics and things like that but still you know it's it's a badge of honor I should I should wear it wear it with pride accessible accessible cervix um <laughs> away from cervixes but not too far, because talking of childbirth, I mean, Jamie's been on excellent form this weekend. We were, we were having dinner last night with my dad. He came up with some crackers talking about childbirth. And he, Jamie suddenly, you know, he'll often sit there and he'll listen for a while and he'll take it all in and then he'll just come out with something. And we're chatting about various forms of childbirth. And Jamie went, so cesarean, he went. Is that a star sign? And we all absolutely <laughs> pissed ourselves laughing. No, mate, no, it's not a star sign. Then, as if to prove his genius, a little bit later, he was um, he was playing around with the, the salt and pepper things on the on the table. Picked up the pepper one, he went, so why has this pepper got a P on the top then? Again, momentary pause. I can't work out if he was serious or not on that one. He also, <laughs> the dessert brought in and it was a delicious looking dessert, eaten mess, which for the uninitiated, strawberries, crushed up meringue and cream in a lovely glass bowl, put in front of Jamie, and he went, oh, brilliant, thank you very much. There was a split-second pause. He went, can I just check? Is this coleslaw? <laughs> yes, mate. Yes, it's coleslaw. That's, what, that's what's been served up for your dessert. It's called, I said, do you usually have coleslaw for dessert? He went, no, but I would have eaten it just to be polite. I said, do you like coleslaw? He said, no, not really. I mean, he's just a, he's just a joy. But, but top of the list, top of the list. Oh, so he was getting... <laughs> he was talking about geography. Long time listeners know I'm not hot on geography either, but Jamie is actually quite good on geography. At least usually. Oh, hi, sandwich. That was sandwich meowing in the background. She's really annoyed that I won't let her sit on my lap because I'm trying to record a, a podcast. Sorry, sandwich. I love you, but but not right now because she will put her anus in my face. And while I'm very used to recording this podcast under less than ideal circumstances, having an anus in your face is definitely not ideal circumstances. Anyway, back to Jamie and his geography. He couldn't get his head around the fact that Holland and the Netherlands are the same place, which I also think is fascinating, you know, countries that have two different names. So we were talking about that. Again, he thought about it for a bit more. He went, so the Netherlands? I said, yeah. And he said, so is that where Danish people come from? We said, no, they come from Denmark. He said, so who comes from the Netherlands? We said, the Dutch. Okay, so it took him a while to get his head around that. He went, so the Netherlands? Yes, Jamie, the Netherlands. Is that the same place as in Peter Pan? And I literally just wept crying. I mean, he's a joy. He's a joy. I can't talk. For a very long time, I thought Sweden was in Africa. So, yeah, I, I, I genuinely, genuinely can't talk. Meanwhile, while all of this was going on, Mr. I Know I Need to Stop Talking was, was at home doing some work. And he had a really relaxing Saturday. No, Friday. God, fuck. I have no idea what fucking day it is. When do the bins go out? Somebody help me. Uh, I'd, I'd left him at home, so he was having a really relaxing Friday night knock when he was sat late at night and ominously heard from upstairs someone typing on one of the keyboards in the room where the kids' computers are, which, you know, when nobody else is in your house is a bit fucking freaky. So he went upstairs only to discover that Brexit, 
fucking liability, had brought in, of course she had, a live mouse, which she was capering around this room with. So Mr. I need to stop talking, spent his nice relaxing Friday evening trying to catch a live mouse which shot off and, and hid amidst, amidst cupboards, etc. So yeah, really lovely, relaxing Friday evening. Almost as relaxing as the time, I think we told this one in here before, when he came back after, I think after Jamie was born, we obviously were both knackered, had been up all night and everything, came back, went into our bedroom just going, oh, just going really relaxing, lie down, opened, we had a loft conversion at the time, opened the Velux window, the bird flew in, so he spent the next half an hour trying to catch this bird, which was obviously shitting and dropping feathers all over the place, so yeah, we do really well with wildlife in this house, we are, it's it's basically like a, a sort of a, an addition, David Attenborough should come and do some kind of documentary in our house on so many, so many levels, so many levels. So my evening is mostly going to be spent watching Jamie inevitably graze through the weekly Ocado shop. It's basically, living with a teenage boy, I've decided the book, The Really Hungry Caterpillar, I've decided that probably was based on a teenage boy because it's literally like on Monday, he ate 12 rounds of toast, three pizzas, four boxes of scrambled eggs and partridge and pear tree and so on and so on and so on. So yeah, I'm just going to just going to watch for, for all of that, all of that to be consumed. The very hungry teenage boy. That is basically what, what life is like right now. And um, maybe while he's doing it, he'll, he'll gen up, gen up on his geography or at least reread Peter Pan is the ne Netherlands in Peter Pan. No, my love. No, that's never Neverland. Oh, thought they were the same thing. I love you. No. I hope you all get to do something lovely and joyous and fun this bank holiday weekend. I hope you get to have those little golden moments of joy. I hope you get to be with the people you love or doing the things that you love. And I hope most of all that you are all keeping safe and well. Look after yourselves, my loves. Stay safe. I will see you next week. Take care. Lots of love. Bye bye.